Hello, welcome, and thanks for participating in this webinar. It's the last of a three-part series on biochar's potential in various applications. My name's Harry Grote, I'm with Dovetail Partners, and I wanna thank Kathleen Draper, Ashley McFarland, and Tom Miles for their invaluable contributions to this project, which include both in-depth reports and these webinars. All of that can be found at the Dovetail Partners website, and we'll be sending you the link to it in the follow-up email once we get everything posted. I want to especially thank the Forest Service for their support, which has made these webinars and the research and detailed reports on which they're built possible. I'm going to move pretty quickly through a review of the project and what was learned about this particular use of biochar in order to maximize our Q&A time. The project team selected three applications where biochar's potential to benefit users was significant and which could use significant amounts of biochar made primarily from woody feedstocks. Choosing the market to supply stormwater management projects with biochar was based on looking at users' experiences, recently published research, as well as the size and scope of stormwater management projects' needs. There is a comprehensive report which details what we learned. The link to it's in the one page summary re you received at the bottom and can also be found on the website where we're archiving the webinars and follow up information. Here are the highlights from the full report about biochar's use in stormwater management. As you can see, biochar has considerable research behind it and it's been used beneficially in stormwater management projects for over a decade now. There's a growing number of biochar producers to choose from, but knowing what you need for a particular application and being certain the biochar you receive or use will fulfill your needs is fundamental for a successful installation. There are a number of examples of stormwater management projects in the report so I won't dwell on specifics now so we can hear from our speakers and get to the q and A. I'm going to digress for a moment because I was talking about potential markets with an emerging biochar producer last week and stormwater management and water filtration were two applications I was really keen on after my work on this report. I also realized that my first engineering job began 50 years ago with trusty slide rule proudly in hand at that point. And I started my journey as a professional engineer that's allowed me to solve problems with innovative as well as tried solutions ever since. Now I wish I had another 20 years to devote to biochar. In the six years I've been involved with biochar, the research about it has exploded and the results of that research have clarified its benefits and caveats. The industry has matured significantly in that short time and biochar as a product has proven its potential to solve multiple problems at once. <clears throat> For instance, here with stormwater management, you can get a relatively low cost media with attributes of activated carbon, which is made from a renewable resource, can contribute to the reduction of wildfire risk and open burning, and sequesters carbon for well beyond any of our lifetimes. It's an impressive product with a future I'm eager to see unfold. Well, enough for me, let me introduce you to our speakers. After a brief intro about biochar from Kathleen Draper, we'll hear from Chuck Hegberg, who's been using biochar in stormwater management projects. Afterwards, we'll go to the Q&As. <clears throat> Kathleen wears many hats in the biochar world, though none are yet made of biochar. She focuses on research, writing, education, and consulting in New York and globally. She's the IBI board chair, is a USBI board member, 
and co-author of the book Burn, which looks at how we can harness carbon to solve the climate crisis. Chuck began his environmental career <clears throat> during the inception of the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Program in 1987. With a focus on non-point source pollution, targeting nutrients and runoff reduction in the Bay's urbanized areas, Chuck began working with biochar in 2006. In 2010, he began partnering with the University of Delaware to study biochar's potential in green infrastructure, such as enhanced media and urban soil repair. Chuck leads business development at Ecotone LLC, an ecological restoration design build B Corp. He also serves on the US Biochar Initiative Board is a technical advisor to the Eastern Biochar Group, past chair for the USBI Biochar 2018 conference, and provides biochar consulting, product development, and sales in the mid-Atlantic, focusing on urban environments. Now let me turn it over to Kathleen. Thanks, Harry. Let me see if I can get my screen up. Okay, and Ashley is going to do the first uh, survey question. So hello all, and on behalf of both the International Biochar Initiative and the U.S. Biochar Initiative, I'd like to thank Harry and Ashley for not only hosting this series of uh, biochar webinars, but also for seeking the funding to gather and synthesize the research, as well as the practical information on the use of biochar in stormwater management, in livestock operations, and in viticulture. It's been incredible to see the response to these three webinars, each one garnering ever more registrations. At last count, Ashley told me we had over 750 people sign up for this one and online with us right now is our more than 260, I think. That's a testament to the growing interest that we have seen in the biochar industry over the last few years. If you're new to the industry or um, even if you aren't, I wanna, welcome you, but also give you a, perhaps a little bit of warning. Uh, biochar can become a bit of an addiction and it has turned some of us into what I call charvangelists because it can sometimes appear a bit too good to be true when you start to learn about all the different uses and benefits. However, much as we would like it to be, biochar is not a silver bullet solution to our climate woes, though it can help materially to both mitigate and adapt to climate change, as you'll hear from Chuck in a minute. Oops. The fundamentals of using heat to convert short-lived sunlight-derived carbon into more durable form of carbon, thereby preventing it from converting back into carbon dioxide and returning to the atmosphere is nothing new. Indigenous cultures from around the world have been combining cooking over fires with the management of excess nutrients and ultimately converting that into highly fertile soils, which enabled civilizations to bloom. Fast forward a few millennia and mankind has figured out how to industrialize the use of heat and limited oxygen combined with a wide variety of organic materials to produce renewable energy, biochar, and other co-products. The variety of different applications for these various types of biochar that are being produced has finally begun to expand, and I would say exponentially, similar to what we saw more than a century ago with fossil fuel-based products. We're at the very beginning of this expansion, but given the climate crisis, we're seeing an increased urgency to move faster and further. Biochar can now be found purifying water, improving stormwater infiltration, remediating brownfields, capping abandoned oil wells, and improving the uh, built environment with lower embodied carbon materials and improving feed for livestock, which then distribute this long-term carbon to pastures and paddocks. The IPCC report in the fall of 2018 highlighted biochar for the first time as one of half a dozen technologies that could help materially rebalance atmospheric carbon. 
I believe that was the inflection point for the industry, as we've seen an absolute explosion of interest in our fledgling yet now flourishing industry. That includes investors, carbon markets, carbon removal buyers, such as Microsoft and Spotify, governments, corporations with large organic waste streams to manage or that have committed to science-based based reduction targets or net zero targets. We're even hearing from more and more urban planners and certification groups like the US Green Building Council. They're asking how biochar can help in their projects and programs. One of IBI's board members recently shared this slide that I thought uh, was great, and Harry was just alluding to this. And this shows the exponential growth that we're seeing in biochar research. 10 years ago, when I first very naively joined the industry, there were roughly about 500 peer reviewed articles per year. Now we're seeing 10 times that amount. And the commercial side is really no different. The amount of planned production capacity for biochar, if everything that we're hearing about gets funded and permitted, will show very substantial growth rates over just the next few years. Have I mentioned that it's an exciting time to be in the biochar industry? If this webinar inspires you to wanna to know more about biochar, there's a growing number of ways that you can do that, some of which I've outlined on this slide. Another brief warning though, it can seem like a bit of a black hole when you first dive into the biochar realm as there is so much information. Plus there's a growing number of online or in-person events that might help you get up to speed. But here are some of the ones that I believe will provide a solid understanding of biochar. And of course, we'd welcome you to become members of IBI. I'm particularly happy to point out the new IBI podcast series that was just launched as there seems to be an increased demand for information about the different technologies available to produce renewable energy and biochar, we launched a series to explore different technologies. And episode zero is up free to everyone and it gives a great overview of pyrolysis and gasification. And our future episodes will focus on individual technologies. So I'm sure you'll get a lot out of this great presentation by Chuck, who has been an absolute pioneer in the use of biochar in stormwater management. So Chuck, over to you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, let me see here. We uh, share in the screen. Can you see me? I can see you. Let me see here. I can see you, but not your screen yet. Try right, the green share it, screen button again. There. there it is. All right, hold on. I forgot I got unshared or un on it. So looks perfect now. Got it. Great. All right. Well, welcome everybody from wherever it is you might be attending. It looks like we have a pretty diverse geography of folks attending this session. And um, thank you to Dovetail and IBI for inviting me to speak. Um, what I'll do here is see if I can get this thing to move. There we go. So we already gone through the introductions. Here's the topics that I'm going to cover here. Um, I'm going to try to move through it fairly quickly so that we can spend some time on, on Q&A. Um, oftentimes, we, we miss out on that ability because we run out of time or whatever. Uh, Harry was kind enough to kind of give us some extra time on this one. But in general, I'm going to cover the some of the biochar benefits. I'm not going to get into biochar in um, great detail only because I'm assuming most folks understand it or they wouldn't be here. Looking at some of the challenges in stormwater management, some green infrastructure and biochar's role, um, amended uh, engineering media. This is this is a pretty exciting space, um, but uh, you know a lot of uh, different types of engineered media from around the country. So you'll have to work on it, developing your own blend for your region that you're working in. I have been focusing heavily on in-situ or urban soil restoration. It's a passion of mine. It's a space that I think is quite challenging, but um, we're getting some really good research from it. And then an area where um, folks often ask is like standards and specifications. So with that, let's go to the next. So what is biochar? Um, essentially, it's, it's carbonized material. It's in low oxygen um, environment or no oxygen, depending on, on what type of system you're using. 
It is an ancient technology as we discovered as, as Kathleen was showing in that graph. Um, you know, when I got into this in 2006, I was looking at it from an agricultural standpoint and then started working on a lake project in 2008, nine. And I'm, it's, it just dawned on me. It's like, well, wait a minute, this is carbon. Why, why aren't we using it for water quality? And there was just absolutely no information available at that time. But now, as you can see from the research, it's just huge quantities of information. So it is an exciting time to be in the biochar space and more recognition of what it can do. The other aspect is, is as you'll, you'll learn when you're in the biochar industry that, that not all biochars are created equal. Obviously, biomass is different. Uh, even in the plant-based or, or wood-based biochars are all different. And then, of course, there's the whole production component of it and how you get there. So uh, particle size distribution and things like that, surface area are all critical. And it's something that, that you'll definitely want to take into account as you're looking at your vendors or um, how you're going to use it in your project. And just a brief summary. Um, the thing that I find so exciting about it is the fact of how it works with the soils and um, or even in the engineered media that you're, you're looking at um, creating in, in the stormwater space and how you can start getting more of the mimicking, at least in engineered media, trying to mimic more of natural soils that are healthy and capable of um, actually supporting life biologically to help deal with the nutrients that we're dealing with or heavy metals or other aspects. So you got the water quality, you got the ability, uh, as we all know, we don't run out of waste streams. Um, there's, there's tons of wood that's being recycled. There's all kinds of biomass from agriculture. So how do we take those streams, some of them ending up in landfills, some of them around the world just being burned, how do we take them and upcycle them into something valuable and usable in what we're trying to do under climate change? And, uh, and really restoration, I mean, this is the decade of ecological restoration for the UN, and it's, it's a great opportunity for biochar to be a play in that process. And of course, the aspect of longevity, not only is it a carbon negative um, process that the, that the, um, the you know, it's being identified now that Kathleen just demonstrated, but it's longevity as compared to organic or labile carbons that we often think of and that we need both in our soils. So on the challenges of, of the urban environment, um, for those of you that actually work in this space, um, I'm sure you're seeing quite a bit of change. And I know I've been in it, you know, since the 80s, and I've seen significant change in, in, in the urban stream restoration that, that I've been involved with, dam removals. But then the flash flooding, this is a, you know, photos to the left here of flash flooding that's occurred numerous times in a, in a town near, near me. The thermal imagery uh, is showing the urban heat island, islands around the world. People are leaving the rural areas and moving to cities. The amount of impervious area that we're creating, um, not only are we creating microclimates and micro weather changes, but just the unhealthy aspects of more people living in a, a compacted area. And with that, you end up with obviously urban runoff that has water quality problems, you know, the, the heavy metals, the nutrients um, from fertilizers and people loving their, their lawns and turfs um, to, to the um, hydrocarbons from pavement and so on. So we're dealing with all of these things. And the challenge now is not only are we having to deal with flashy uh, quantities, higher quantities with flash floods, but we also have all this um, nutrients and, and pollutants that we have to deal with in stormwater. So one of the areas that um, I've been trying to get people thinking about again is to, to remember a lot of times in science, we try to break things down to its simplest thing that we're trying to identify. We're trying to teasing out everything just to try to get an answer to one thing. But we often forget um, in our research and even in our work with policy and, and efforts that we get so myopic on certain topics like, oh, we gotta get rid of nitrogen or we gotta get rid of sediment or, and we, we tend to forget that, that all these systems, whether it's climate, whether it's a hydrologic cycle, nutrient cycle, they're all interconnected. And we need to remember that carbon is the center of all those um, topics, all those cycles that we need to interconnect. 
So if you're trying to remove nitrogen or trying to deal with phosphorus, you've got to get carbon in there. Uh, carbon could be in a number of forms. It could be labile carbon, it could be recalcitrant carbon. But either way, we need to remember the, um, the earth cycles and how does it all interrelate with what we're trying to accomplish. So for those that aren't involved with green infrastructure um, or you know, dealing with green infrastructure and stormwater, I just wanted to try to give a quick definition of it. And obviously it's the management of stormwater runoff using ecosystem, natural ecosystems and or engineered systems that mimic natural systems. And that's where a lot of in our urban systems, you might see the you know, concept of rain gardens and green roofs like you see here on the left trying to create in our urban paved areas these, these um, systems that are trying to mimic a natural system. But you can also use natural systems, nature-based designs, or um, you know, creating wetlands and other components that are natural ecosystems to also do what, what the mimic systems are trying to do as well. So from a history standpoint, green infrastructure has been around and stormwater management has been around since ancient civilization, you know, with the Romans and so on. But it hasn't been until the last, oh, you know, 20 or so years since the 80s uh, around the Chesapeake Bay that we've started moving into different types of, of, of uh, stormwater management um, activities. And now you see it around the world. I mean, you've got sponge cities in China, um, you've got the sustainable urban drainage systems in the UK and, and Europe area. Low impact development is common across the country, but it once was originally started out in Prince George's County, Maryland. So as this begins to expand, there are a zillion different ways that biochar can be used in these different types of green infrastructure and add benefit to what you're trying to accomplish. And so one of the areas that I began to work with, as it was mentioned back in 2010, was just looking at, well, how can biochar be utilized, at least in my region of the Chesapeake Bay, for um, stormwater management and nutrient re reduction, because that's what our target was with the Chesapeake Bay. And so we began to look at some of the direct benefits to utilizing biochar. And originally, it was looking at engineered media. How do you, how do you improve? The functionality of engineered media, and I think that would be my will be my next slide. I'll get into, but it's the large pore volume um, capacity, it's the increased water retention, and the capturing of the first flush of runoff. That's that's what we were targeting as our goals. Biochar is able to do that through high uh, cation exchange capacity and surface area, the, uh, the absorption of nitrogen compounds, and the re uh, uh, reduced effluent concentrations. So we were able to start to look at that. And what I'll do is jump over into the, some of that work with the uh, engineered media. So <clears throat> for those that have been involved with engineered media, um, you know, designing bioretention facilities, green um, rain gardens, um, bioswales, other, uh, other aspects, um, they're supposed to be a combination of obviously water, some sort of soil media and plants. You need the plants to interact with the soil media and the water to in order to clean, obviously clean the, the, the water that you're trying to treat from the runoff. But most of the material that's created as a engineered media is predominantly sand, 80% most times. And it may have some wood in it, uh, mulch or, or compost. But in general, it's a very poor media to keep plants alive. If you start adding too much uh, compost or other things to it, you'll start to choke it up and no longer is it functioning as an infiltration and storage vessel for, for stormwater management and treatment. So trying to find that balance where you can get all three working together was critical. And so with, with most systems using the, the um, sand, um, they are pretty good at removing suspended solids and bacteria, heavy metals, mainly the metals uh, from, the, from the compost being placed in it. But it was poor in nitrogen removal, in the nitrification and denitrification process. They were also, as I mentioned, prone to clogging and, and fouling. And we've got probably hundreds of miles of linear bioretention facilities along highways that have no plants or they're not infiltrating. Um, so, so they're really not serving the purpose that we've spent all the money on. And then, of course, we've always had poor uh, vegetative support with, with a 
uh, traditional um, bioretention media. So one of the studies that was done by the University of Delaware, um, actually it was funded by um, DELDOT or Delaware Department of Transportation is that they were having this problem of both all the issues of no plants, poor, poor infiltration, but also the purpose of those in our area again was to be able to remove nutrients. And of course, if you go adding compost to your, to your mix or even mulch, ultimately you're gonna be release, releasing um, nutrients back into the system. So what the University of Delaware did was take a, a number of different bioretention mixes and, and begin to kind of change up the, the blends to see which one would actually perform best with the least amount of, of nutrient release. And there are some other um, studies or, or slides that I have related to plant growth in the greenhouses and stuff, but I didn't, with time, I didn't put those in. But here's a, a good breakdown. Um, you can see the, the uh, North Carolina mix, which is primarily sand, some fines, and then sawdust. Whereas the um, Delaware mix was sand, mulch, and compost. And there was a very big difference in what you get out of it. So as you can see here, the North Carolina with and without, with biochar, you can see the water quality bit difference. And then of course you can see it with um, the compost and, and the, um, well actually the mulch and the compost. So over here onto your right, you can see the, the pure uh, materials just flush to see how much was actually in the original material. Of course, there is a little bit left over in the biochar after pro uh, processing. Um, you can see the mulch obviously releases and then of course compost. So again, your starting materials are critical as you're you know, sort of mixing up this, this blended um, product. You have to think about what it is you're putting together. So in general, <clears throat> what the, what the um, study uh, determined, and, and this was also not just mixing the material as related to being in the, in the lab and running through columns, there was also some micro bioretention facilities um, built next to a parking lot and they did some dosing um, with a fire hydrant and some nitrogen <clears throat> to get it into the, into the system. And what they found was that they were able to retain upwards to 27% more stormwater. Uh, that's in the porosity of the biochar. That's important um, because of redox and the ability for nitrogen to get completely converted and um, also provide more plant available water. What, what we're finding, and that's with my next point here is the higher redox, is in a bioretention mix, um, if it you know, dries out too fast, you're not getting that um, electron exchange capacity going, you're not, or electron storage capacity because it's a ability to take an electron and re release an electron for the denitrification process. The other aspect is being able to flip the bioretention mix or the system to go anaerobic and aerobic. <clears throat> in wastewater treatment, you, you have it anaerobic and then they aerate it for aerobic to change up the type of microbes that you're dealing with. So that, that's, that's an important element of seeing that material dry out, but being the water being held in the porosity of the, the biochar for higher redox. One of the things with bioretention mix is because they're sand, oftentimes just like at a beach, <clears throat> when it's dry, you know, sand's loose. And then when it's wet, it's kind of compacted. And over time, because sand is, is a, a rounded, it'll start to compact. What we found with the biochar is that it, it did not compact. It, in fact, it increased infiltration rates while still absorbing 27% more water um, by four times. So it's sort of a high flow media in, in that process. <clears throat> Over a year and a half, there was no um, real clogging, much less clogging. And then we had an increased nitrogen removal um, upwards to 55%. And that was for all the storms. And then nit nitrate removal was seasonal, as you would expect <clears throat> from winter to fall and so on in spring and summer that the biological functions would change. But 
that varied from 60 to 370 um, percent. A lot of the biochar increased phosphorus release. We, we saw this both in our bio media, bioretention media. But we also found this in any soil in situ soil amendment that we actually did end up releasing more um, phosphorus. Um, and then also in the media, it was because of compost. But in the soils, we believe it's, and we don't know for sure, but we believe it's just the um, phosphorus that's in the soils for many years of agricultural use or whatever that was not released once the biology and once the um, pH and other aspects started to change in the soil with the addition of the biochar that it became available and, and was released into the system. But um, you can see here again, the um, percentage of biochar um, in the North Carolina mix. And then of course the release of nitrogen <coughs> in the um, Delaware mix. And then the same with, with the phosphorus, which was, was um, basically the same as nitrogen. And let me take a, another swig here. <coughs> so some of the considerations um, is particle size and distribution is important for KSAT. A lot of times you might get biochar from a vendor and it might be sawdust and it's all the same particle size. Um, if it's too fine, particularly in sand, you're going to choke up your system. Um, and plus you don't provide the diversity of particle size distribution <coughs> to allow for um, the, the material to get in between the, the particle sizes and create your macro and micro pores in the system and keep it from being compacted. Um, the present volume also is important for water holding capacity too much and you'll saturate and hold too much water. And um, if you're using landscape plants, you'll end up killing them um, or you'll convert it to a wetland, <laughs> which may not be what you want either. The, a lot of times in your media mix, people look at it and say, oh, I just have wood. Well, target your blends to what you're trying to target is, is your pollutant removal. So for instance, in heavy metals, plenty of research to show that various types of bio manure chars, maybe blended with a wood char, will provide a higher metal reduction than just looking at a wood char alone. Um, quality control, product consistency, obviously, if you're trying to do a premix and uh, get it out into the system, you need to make sure what you're getting is consistent so you can your vendors or whatever can blend the material as necessary. Um, recognize that as you're trucking at biochar's light, um, particularly if it dries out and it will start to settle in your truck as you get it there. So you'll need to make sure you, you mix it up again before you go placing it. So you don't get some leveling or layering of materials. Biochar should be moistened prior to mixing it. It's so light, We've even in, in our in-situ work, if we don't have the moisture right, it, it'll just float on top. It won't, it won't get down into the depths that you're trying to get it to. So it does have to have some moisture to kind of work with the materials as you're mixing them. Um, yeah, overhandling, you can start, biochar can be brittle. Overhandling it, you may be specking a particle size, but by the time you actually get it where you want, it may not be the size that you're looking for. And, um, Avoid, I've seen this oftentimes in, in any form of BMP, particularly, uh, um, or green infrastructure, particularly if it's, if it's meant to be an infiltration type system, is compacting in the sub base um, and compacting of the, of the media. Because if it's a larger system, getting the media out there, they're running equipment on it and um, you're, you're compacting up your material. So be sure to, to monitor that. And lastly, be sure to, um, Test your sub-base infiltration as well as your final infiltration to make sure that it wasn't compacted uh, on that. And here are a few examples. Um, these are basically microbiofilters, bioreactors, bioswales. A little, each one's different. The one on the left here is at a at a farm, um, just using a little bioswale. This one here is a bioreactor, what they call it a wood chip bioreactor, being done. Um, on a farm area as well. And then to the right here is actually a bioswale that was done <coughs> in Delaware um, for highway drainage on it. And um, they're all functioning, functioning well. Rain gardens, 
and um, bio, bioretention facilities. A bioretention facility is just bigger. Um, these, these are areas that um, great opportunity to integrate biochar into the, into the urban uh, landscape. Uh, and and they've been quite successful. I haven't seen enough of them done, but um, we should hopefully be seeing more as people gain more interest. This one here, the Stockholm one, I just, I just love what these guys have done. And I am pushing like crazy to get some people to try all this in some of our more highly urbanized areas, um, which is basically just biochar and stone. So instead of using the, the, um, the subsurface plastic crates, while those will provide you probably 93 to 95% void space for water holding, they're just not gonna give you the benefits that this type of system will do, even just using rock. The biochar in there, um, the plant material, the trees for, for further evapotranspiration, and they're just far more aesthetic than, than some of the other systems that are out there. So this one is definitely one to consider. And then this one here, I like this one because as you can see on the right, it's just a completely solid paved area with pavers. But for, for my region, I'm really targeting this concept for these, in, in our built out communities, there's very little green space. And what there is, is sometimes that area uh, is sort of like a cartway greenway path. It's the area from the, from the curb to the backside of the sidewalk. And that area there is most municipalities own it. They have an easement to utilize it. And for the most part, it goes underutilized except for to run utilities. And sometimes in some communities, you don't even have storm drain systems. And in mine and many places in Pennsylvania do not. And so this is a, a much better way of both getting stormwater management quantity control, as well as getting quality control and it'd be aesthetic. Um, if you want it to go back to turf and the, and the land, own homeowner is to maintain it, then you can put it back to turf. You can put it back to pavers. You could put it into um, building a, um, you know, sort of a, a rain garden or, or native landscaping on it. It's very, very flexible, and um, it also works around utilities well. And in, in urban areas, one of the biggest challenges of doing stormwater is the constraints related to not owning land, limited green space, um, and utilities. So this sort of checks all the boxes for me and, and I, I really hope to be able to get some of this going um, here where I'm located. And then green roofs. <clears throat> the green roofs, um, lots of research going on with it in Canada, Germany, other places. Uh, I, they're expensive to build. They're usually in your highly urbanized areas. Um, I know Washington DC is a big player in trying to do green, green roofs. What I like about the idea of adding biochar to green roofs is, is a number of things. Number one is the water holding capacity. Um, that's critical. Number two, it will help lighten the load of it, of the media in the green roof um, site uh, project. Three is that you can increase the depth of your green roof material. And that's important because most of the time we're trying to plant succulents, you know, um, shallow media. And, um, but in this case, you could actually move to pollinators and other types of media, uh, types of, of plants that would be much greater beneficial um, to, the, to the water quality as well as the habitat. Uh, the fourth one is uh, something I'll show you in a moment is for uh, energy management. And yes, green roofs can help with energy. Um, but what we're finding with the biochar is it actually acts as a, a thermal treatment in the sense of in the winter, it holds the heat. And in the summer, it actually cools it because of evapotranspiration and the amount of water, that extra 27%, takes a lot of energy to evaporate it. And so you get that additional cooling that goes on. And that, that's, a, that's a really interesting um, idea, particularly with all the energy rates going up as they are. How much could this actually help save um, in building management? So what I'm going to do now, let me check my time here, I'm running a little low, so let me speed up, is jump into urban uh, soil restoration. And uh, it's an area of great interest. 
So in our urban environments, I'm going to focus on the scenario C and the D because those are the areas that are most um, challenging for folks to deal with. And that's and, and most of our urban centers are located in that type of scenario where they're 30 percent or, you know, um, 30 to 50 percent, almost 100 percent impervious. So in the U.S. and in the Chesapeake Bay, I mean, we've got, you know, 40 million acres of lawns. These areas basically um, are just spaces. They're, I just assume they're like green concrete. Uh, they're, they're hard. They, they got some green on them. We use lots of fertilizer. We spend many, many uh, millions of hours pretending to them. But they're an area that is not being considered heavily for, for stormwater management, with the exception of maybe some house disconnections, rain barrels, uh, and trying to get rain gardens into, the, into these environments, which many, many landowners don't want. But this is an area that we need to really start to reevaluate, particularly with climate change and our in, uh, very intense storm events. And so we're, we're the best place to target, and this is a research paper from, from Carolyn Voter, um, now with the University of Delaware. She found that soil decompaction at the same time of doing disconnections at hot spots were the best way to go. Not necessarily doing the whole turf area, but just targeting areas and was that was getting the best results. So that could be a huge cost savings in this process. And, and as you can see from this slide, in most cases after um, new construction, land isn't being you know, repaired. It's basically being graded out, a little bit of topsoil being thrown on it, and then either seeded or, or turf being put down. But it's actually you know, soil compaction and the lack of carbon in those soils are the, one of the major factors of our impacts of runoff in, in our urban uh, environments. And so it's, it needs to be the next frontier that we're sort of targeting. So as part of that, one of the studies we did in uh, oh, 2014, I think it was, um, was to do this amending greenways along highways. And it was funded by the uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as part of the Chesapeake Bay program. So we ended up you know, amending, having a tilled and untilled area. We, we also had, a, obviously, um, as uh, in place, but not non-impacted. But we tilled essentially to 12 inches and added 4% by mass biochar in it. And then it was very heavily gauged with all kinds of, of optics and, and data collection and for, for runoff analysis. And what was critical in this, what we found was, and now this isn't like, exact because it shows rounded biochar and in biochar of course you can see is an irregularly shaped and that's critical what we're finding is is that biochar when it's first put into soils actually if it's a a, a, a nicely blended um, biochar like the one on the left with various particle sizes biochar initially charged or uncharged starts out functioning as an aggregate almost like a geotechnical type of aspect or a soil particle analysis. It, so when it starts as an aggregate, it starts to increase oxygen, it starts to increase water infiltration, micropore, macropores of the soil, not just the biochar. That's important and that's where you have your intraporosity in there. So you have dual, two things going on there. And as the water begins to infiltrate, you get more aero, aerobic bacteria forming up rather than anaerobic. At that point, you start kickstarting the bi biology function, and when the biology function gets in there, that's when you start to get natural aggregation going on. So that's an important aspect of what happens. So it starts out as an aggregate, and then it becomes natural aggregation with ag the aggregates. And here's an example of how this happened over about a six to eight month period on this project. You can see the shifting of the of the particle size, where is it here? Particle size over in here on this process with it. The other aspect is we maintained our bulk um, density aspects so that root depth growth could increase. This is the part where roots can't get through under the um, stress. And this was the, the original soils. This is if you just till it, it starts to move back to original, but the biochar remained um, suitable for plant growth to continue to go through at, and with its dry bulk density. Runoff reduction, um, here's an attenuation of peak flow. 
over this one storm was about 77 percent here's the here's the um the difference on the the highway down to the biochar and then over here you can see the cumulative of runoff reduction associated with with the um, biochar amendment at four percent keep in mind this is only the top 12 inches of the of the soil that we treated and the area was only about let me think six six feet wide by 20 feet long so it's a very small area but very effective and then when you looked at a cumulative of the 84 storms we were essentially capturing um i like to say this carefully it's it's we are capturing 100% of 84, no, 84% of, no, 100% of the 84 storms were coming. We were capturing 100% of those storm events. So meaning we were capturing the, the first flush, the smaller storms, and we weren't getting uh, any of the high uh, runoff until we had the higher storms. So that's big because the majority of our storms are small. They're not normally very large storms. So we weren't getting any runoff associated with it. And then here's the cooling factor. Um, as you can see, the blue is the unamended soil. So it's very extreme how it bounces back and forth. Whereas the biochar is very um, is much less um, extreme in its uh, temperature changes. Plus, this is the area where microbial optimal range is. Um, but more important, you can see how, how much of a difference it is in these temperatures and the swings that were happening um, during this, this time period. The thing that we found was, and you can see by the slope in itself here, is that it warms quicker and cools slower. Um, it's cooler in the summer. It was less wild extremes in temperature. And then it inc the increased water holding capacity and microbial uh, activities. Those were sort of the drivers as to why the temperatures started to, to um, um, meet, meter themselves. Now, keep in mind, this was, of course, um, soils that were amended and actually had vegetation growing on it. So I can't speak to if something isn't growing, what it would do temperature wise and water um, holding capacity. We can assume, but in this case, we did have grass growing. The um, the process here that we're looking at now is this is the normal 12 inch treatment and we're looking towards getting into the deeper treatment aspects. And that's using um, the, the tiller for the, it's not a tiller, it's actually a harrow. I would recommend a harrow over a tiller for this type of work. And then a pneumatic um, decompaction technology, which basically sends a probe into the ground and fractures the soils and then you amend the, the, the upper end. So we're looking at that um, for, for um, some of the green spaces and turf now. So as I just mentioned, um, you wanna use a harrow rather than a, a horizontal tiller. Um, the tiller just brings rocks up and has a very hard time pushing the, the carbon down. You wanna make sure you have good particle size distribution, but also when you're in putting it in, you wanna make sure that it has a really good you know, moisture to it so that the biochar doesn't just float on top. Uh, you need to get it down into the soils. Um, as I mentioned, by, I already mentioned on the aggregate and it must be moistened. And here's some of the work we were doing along the um, Delaware highways here, just a small, this is uh, five foot. So we're looking about eight feet here. And then the biochar is being put down at 4%. There's a, a look of it. And then we ended up seeding it and matting it. And um, so we've been doing that along Delaware highways. Here's what the reason why we're starting to look at the deep decompaction. It doesn't connect directly to biochar with, with the exception of the amendment, but I think it's something that bears mentioning because of the potential for actually helping with climate change, the extreme storm events and the uh, water quantity management which we seem to be having a lot of problems dealing with now, is that this was a pond that was basically supposed to be an infiltration basin. So as you can see, it's not working. We went in and used the deep soil decompaction technology. And just in a, a few months, six to eight months, this is what it looks like now. Um, vegetation's growing and they're gonna start um, doing a few more ponds, which is why going back to that diagram, doing the deep decompaction on top of amending the topsoil 
area, you're kind of building a, a carbon filter uh, for any runoff or any water going in before it goes down into the deeper um, areas. So again, a couple uh, just things to think about. One, please, I, I know there's a lot of, of specs out there about ripping, tilling, tearing, excavating. Um, I did that and I foobarred the project. Um, here's an, right here where we were following the specs, um, tearing these soils and turning them and turning the biochar in. And I actually ended up with worse infiltration capacity than I had to begin with. Now we're, we're going to go in and fix it, but better off don't dis, dis, you know don't destroy the soil um, structure if you all possible. Using a subsoiler like this that lifts the soil and fractures it to allow air and water to get in there is, is perfect. Then coming in and putting the biochar and using your HARO to get it down into the 12 inch zone. So rip down to two, two feet, that's about the max that these things will go, two feet. The deep pneumatic can go four feet, sometimes six, depending on rock and soil. But rip it first, or subsoil it, let me not use the word ripping, use the subsoiler and then come in and use the HARO for your top portion of it. And I think you'll find you'll have much better success than doing some of this stuff that, that is being put out there um, so that you're not destroying the, the soil structure. And I think I might've covered most of these on the standards. Most people are like, how do I get it in? How do I use it? Now, if you work with, um, Government agencies, a lot of times, if, as you're, if you're an engineer and all, you can you can write um, special provisions. Um, and now, a special provision would only be for a project specific type of uh, use. So it's not it's not a standard specification, which is basically can be pulled out of the book and put into a drawing and used anywhere. There are a number of DOTs, and in, in, in the U.S., the DOTs are sort of the leaders in in some of this development. Um, Dell DOT has invested a tremendous amount as well as Maryland Department of Transportation and North Carolina DOT. Caltrans has been looking at metals. I know on the West Coast, metals are a big deal. Uh, BDOT um, is working with a research group on salts. Uh, I don't know how that one's going to go, but again, if they add some am amendments or, or catalysts to it, they might be able to do better with that. So working at your state levels or local government levels, um, or is helpful. In the private sector, um, generally you can get away with a bit more. So, or design build type projects because you're responsible for them. So look at all your different BMPs you're using, look at your different projects and see where you can actually integrate biochar into it and start with a special, probably more of a special provision. Um, lastly, I've seen a lot of different specs come out and they are all over the map. For, so you need to you need to clearly define what the purpose is. Second, be sure it'll be you know di, uh, identifying a a source of supply that's IBI certified. They help set the standards, um, and and you can be comfortable that if it meets those standards, it's 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 not having the issues with dioxins, PAHs, and and unsustainable sources. Uh, the um, remember that they're not all created equal. Um, getting it local is, is a bonus. I get that question all the time, is it made locally? The issue is, is that you aren't going to get um, biochars that meet every one of your project standards just locally, um, not at this point in time in the industry. So get what's going to work the best um, for your project. You need to make sure you clearly define the physical, chemical, and particle size distribution of your, your requirements. A lot of times people just say biochar. And then they tell you to get it in tons. Don't do it in tons. Um, tons is a challenge because you've, you've got all kinds of, each biomass is different. So you may end up with more volume or less volume of what you really want to do. I would say in most construction projects, unless it's stone, you're doing it in cubic yards or some form of measurement of that. Um, you, you know, soil, topsoil, compost, everything is in cubic yards. So the contractors are used to that. So be sure to do that, um, use, use cubic yards rather than tonnage. Unless you're using manure char because it's high ash, you're better off to use tonnage. 
so with that, I hope we're good on time. And um, I'm not sure, Kathleen or Harry, are you we pushing it over? Yeah. We... And there are dozens of questions. <laughs> I hope I didn't sound like a northerner. <laughs> <laughs> well, not to me, since I am a northerner. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't even know where to start, Harry. I may just go from the top. We, we are only ad, able to answer a few ourselves. But one thing I did want to add, because I took a group to the Stockholm Biochar Project, is they actually take out all of the soil and start from, you know, about two meters down. And they put a layer of the biochar first. And then they truck in what look like black stones. But it is about, I forget what the actual ratio, ratio is, 70% stone gravel, and then half mulch and half biochar. So it was really interesting system. And they've tested every kind of biochar out there. And it's not as uh, specific in terms of the type of biochar for that particular system. Um, as it is for other applications like filtration. So. Right, right. And then that one there, their mulch, I believe, was actually on the surface. And, the, and if it was, it was probably a 70-30 a because most of the time with stone, it's a 30% void space. So yeah. they were filling the, the, the void space with the biochar. And I don't believe they were too, like you said, too particular on the particle size. Um, whereas when you're dealing with in situ soils, you need to be concerned of particle size. Yeah, yeah. And they're one of the biggest buyers of biochar in the European market is, you know, for that, for that purpose is stormwater management. I hope to build a few of them here. I haven't <laughs> been able to get the grant funding for it. Maybe with the infrastructure bill. Hopefully. We'll see. They, they do have a carve out for biochar made from woody biomass. So this would be a good one. Um, Harry, do you want to just start from the top here? Yeah, let's start from the top, and, and I'd like to let everybody know that we will uh, collect all the uh, questions and get them answered and have a document posted on the website as one of the resources with the, uh, the webinar recording. So if it doesn't get answered today, we will still get an answer to you. And Kathleen, I've still got bandwidth issues, so if you wouldn't mind sure. okay. leading up. Yeah, well, one question that didn't get asked, but I get asked this all the time, and I think, Chuck, you would know better than I do, is what happens to particle size with the freeze frost cycle? Did you guys look at that, or do you not have enough freezing and frosting down in Maryland? Well, we do, um, but as you saw in that thermal, like that one year, I can't remember, I was seeing, that was 2014, 2016, might have been 2015 or 2016, I mean, you would have thought it was freaking Minnesota here. It was so cold, but those soils never froze. So in some aspects, I think the, the thermal mass with the biochar and the water, it heats up those soils and it keeps them actively going. That is a question that comes up. What I find is it's not as important, at least in my view at this moment, as important to think about because as I mentioned, the biochar acts as an aggregate. Think of it as like carbon stone, right? Um, that you're getting from a quarry. And when you add it to the soils and you get the, the oxygen and water and the macropores and micropores all in place, once the microbes are going, they start the natural aggregation. So the biochar is the, the critter condo, the microbial condo which is then through plant extradates and all or bringing it in and starting to create those aggregates. You've essentially, like in any form of ecological restoration, you're not there to make it what it's supposed to be at the end product. You're basically accelerating time to get to help allow nature to heal itself. So we're sort of jump-starting the process. And then after that, as I've told you know, folks before, it goes from being an amendment to being part of the system. So it's sort of that concept on that. That's a great way to put it. Uh, someone asked if uh, coupling biochar and microbes in applications has been successful in enhancing many of these remediation uh, initiatives. Yeah, I haven't really been involved with a lot of the remediation aspects, but I'll tell you in my you know, earlier days, I was looking at phytoremediation. EPA was really big on that. 
And it was all about, you know, getting uh, molasses down in the soils and injecting different types of um, microbes and things. Honestly, I think that if we were to, to look at that, um, sort of that soil, soil food how, um, web and, and understanding the type of microbes that we want to do a certain type of work, oils or whatever, if you were to combine that with biochar as the host for those microbes, as well as the food source that they need, I think you would definitely see an improvement in those processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you comment on how uh, soil properties influence the infiltration and retention rates? Yeah. So what we do, and I don't, again, that was another, you could get into much more detail on that. When we first started to get into this, you know, you have your hydrologic soil groups, A, B, C, Ds, right? So Ds are more your clays, heavy, not infiltrating, and your As are sand. And when you look at the soil pyramid, you know, you always want to target loam that's sort of in the center. So how do you create a particle size distribution and a mix um, that will function like a loam that provides both for the habitat holding capacity and infiltration. So um, that would be the best way to kind of look at it using a little bit of geotechnical or soil, soil characteristic profiling and say, what am I missing? And how do I blend some of it together that way? I am now becoming more of a believer that a, a you know, 80, 20, say 80% biochar, 20% compost. And I don't mean compost, I mean like a leaf grow or a leaf uh, mold type or something like that, or even smaller, uh, 90, 10, to get the microbes jump started in there, as well as some of the labile carbon that might be missing in the soils. You got to be able to feed the microbes, right? If you don't have that um, understanding on it, you can always add microbes to your soil afterwards, like through a, a microbial extract or something like that. So again, we have to think systems, not just I'm adding biochar. How do I get the plants, soil, microbes, you know, and, and water all working together in a system? Mm -hmm. Great. There were a couple of questions related to nitrogen. One was asking about the mechanism for nitrogen removal. Uh, and the other was, did you need to do anything to the biochar to optimize it, like reducing pH? And if so, how is that done? No, we didn't, you know, we did not modify the biochar. I mean, obviously, we, um, we started out with a very good biochar. Um, when we got into this back in the 2012, you know, it was pretty limited on what you could find on it, but we, we got some good stuff. It was high temperature, um, very good surface area. And we pretty much used it as it was. I mean, to be quite honest, you know, we're thinking scale, you know, we're not, how, how are you gonna do three miles of a highway and do that with the biochar and make it cost effective, right? So we basically went in with the blind approach of just saying, we're not gonna add any additional components to what we're doing. We're going to take the biochar and just put it in the soil and let's see what happens um, or adding it right directly to the to the um, bioretention mix. Um, now we're looking at going, OK, now we maybe want to start playing with the magic sauce a little bit to see how that works. The the nitrogen removal and, and there's actually a paper by um, University of Delaware, Dr. Imhoff is a part of the author as well. And when we talk about um, it was actually a joint work between Dr. Imhoff, um, Paul Imhoff and Dr. Pei Xu. And Pei has been really focused in on the electron storage capacity of biochar. You know, how is biochar functioning as a battery, giving and taking electrons? And so what they found was we were getting complete, and they're more the expert in it than I am on it, we were getting complete nitrogen conversion to N2 gas. Because of the ability of the bioretention to go aerobic, anaerobic, and that redox of it, they were getting the microbes switching. And there's a paper, I don't remember, it's by Tien, one of the students that talked about it, because it was actually discovered when they added zero valent iron with it as a mix, 
and they found the zero valent iron got exhausted quickly, but yet the denitrification didn't stop, meaning that microbes took over and were actually processing the whole deal. There's like two or three papers on that topic that, that could be um, looked up for anybody that really wants to delve into that side. Mother Nature took over as, as she tends to do. <laughs> and that's, that's, what, oh, that's all we can do. That's all we can do. So. Yeah. Question on how long it would take or when do you expect to see a drop in the efficiency of heavy metal removal? This goes to, you know, saturation point. And what do you do then? Do you try to excavate or? Now, I don't know. I mean, we have to remember that, that the limits that EPA puts down on some of these is very, very, very low. Um, and if you're dealing in a super fun site, or some area like a military base or whatever with explosives or whatever, then, then I would look at designing a facility where you could remove the material and, and then put in fresh material. If you're looking at heavy metals, hydrocarbons, maybe some PCBs or other things that in our environment, our general environment are, are generally low, but you might have a, a permit like a TMDL permit on it. Um, it would be quite a long time, if at all, that you're going to get saturation of biochar on it. You're going to be uh, capturing in situ um, and in not getting into the into the biological stream, but it's still captured. Um, the only one that, that I could see a challenge is sometimes is, is um, E. coli bacteria. There's different types of those. And there was a study out of Australia that demonstrated that biochar absorbs E. coli bacteria so quickly that you could actually capture it on the surface and actually still be a problem, right? It's still accessible to humans and others. So you have to be careful if you're trying to tackle bacteria that you're actually getting the water through and then into the carbon. Um, so it's not a surface um, bacteria, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a related question uh, asking, is it a mix it and forget it type of application or can you recover it after saturation? And I've been working with a group, group out on Long Island that I know you know too, Chuck, and they're looking at using biochar in septic systems to capture um, phosphorus maybe, but mostly nitrogen. And, and the thinking there is that it might um, reach saturation eventually, but you could design those septic systems to be harvested and then and put that, um, that saturated biochar, which has good stuff, not heavy metals, somewhere else where it's needed and bring in new biochar. So and that's that, a good point, similar to acid mine drainage. But in acid mine drainage, you might find that manure char, like poultry litter char, mixed with a, a small amount of compost actually works better. And then you have a product that you could utilize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone was asking for a source of information regarding the biochar treatment of road runoff. And I think you answered that one. You had a little citation by the UDEL work, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a National Science Foundation um, study. It's called... Um, biochar amended greenways or greenway, you know, something of that nature. I can't remember the exact title um, on it, but it's readily available PDF. It, it goes through all of it and talks about a variety of things. We even evaluated the each individual particle size, dish, you know, as far as its effect um, on infiltration and stuff. So, so it's a good, good report um, to be looking at for, for in situ material. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the specifications for the biochar for this particular end use, and someone wanted to know whether the pyrolysis temperature has a material impact. Do you prefer high or low, or is it more feedstock specific? Um, when we, I, I prefer high temperature, particle size distribution, probably anywhere between two and four millimeters with the uh, tailing off, so a nice, you know, bell curve. Um, not a lot of fines. Uh, and then as far as, you know, high surface area that is more macro pores, um, higher macro pores than, than nano or micro. Of course, you're going to get micro, but so it's going to be more like a soft wood, a pine, something like that, that would give you that. Uh, when we first got into this, our, our original thinking was we were all excited about, oh, 27% water holding capacity. How much, you know, 
And ultimately, when we got into it, it, that was the minor. It was actually the capacity to change infiltration of C and D soils. And this idea, when you start looking at a watershed scale of doing what we're defining as hydrodynamic shifting, how do we shift based on watershed shape and size and stuff? How do we shift from a C and D predominant soils to something that's functioning like an A or B in the watershed? And that, you know, as a scale is a huge change in water quantity management as well as quality. So our, our thinking ultimately ended up in is that the capacity of soils to start functioning as infiltration facilities, again, as compared to the holding capacity. Now, the holding capacity is still great, but that's not the main driver we're finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things with climate change that we need to adapt quickly for all this flooding that's happening all over the world. Uh, a question on phosphorus. How, what, what kind of um, amounts of phosphorus can biochar absorb? Which I think you answered this, but um, it's not really great for that. Although there is no. somebody on this call as a participant that I know is studying that. Yep. Shannon, if you want to answer it in the chat. <laughs> and, and also I saw John Minima is on here too, and he's, he's studying it as well. Um, and he's doing some amendments and stuff to his work and, and getting great results. Actually, as I mentioned, we found that we were releasing actually more available phosphorus that was bound up in the system. So from all our years of adding fertilizers, a lot of these lands used to be agriculture. They got compacted, went anaerobic, and therefore the phosphorus isn't available because there's nothing, no, no microbe, anaerobic microbes going to convert phosphorus. So once you switch these soils to being back to aerobic, now all of a sudden you've got biology that can convert the phosphorus to make it plant available. And we were actually seeing a release of phosphorus um, in the process. Yep, I've heard that from many different folks. Someone wanted uh, you to comment more on the importance of KSAT. All right, so the KSAT is the, the infiltration ability. So it's the rate at which water is able to infiltrate through the soils. Um, they use it. They use it for septic systems, things like that. And um, so we measure, we measure that uh, as our means to figure out how much volume of water with infiltration or absorbing on it. Mm -hmm. All right, and then someone asked for a clarification. You had mentioned 4% and they wanted to know if that's by volume or weight. I think you answered that one as well. 4% by, by weight. Yeah. Yeah, so you probably, depending on your system, be more about um, you know, somewhere around based on the blend mixes, probably 14 to 18% by volume. I personally believe that 4% is more than you need. I honestly believe that with soil aggregation, all we could probably be safe around two to 3%, 2%, which when you start talking scale, that's a lot of biochar. And then that's a <laughs> lot of cost savings, right? I mean, you know, it's, it does make a difference when you're talking about 12 inches of, of that volume of biochar. So I think we can go back, we can back down. And that's being studied yeah. right now. Yeah. Although we may need to find big areas to put a lot of carbon. <laughs> so uh, somebody wanted to uh, know a little bit more about how the decompactor works. Okay. So so it's a pneumatic decompactor. There's a variety of different ones around the world. Um, some of them are really great for around, you know, smaller depths and trees. Some are only 12 inches for turf, like golf courses and all. This particular one will do on average between three or four feet or down to six, depending on soils. And we're at about 300 PSI. It puts an inch and a half probe down in the ground and you pop it and it it, the earth moves like a, like a waterbed. So think of it almost like that subsoil or just lifting and fracturing the soil. And then you have that probe hole, which then we often will put either pumice or, you know, gravel or something in there to, and then amend the soil on the top. So that way you create that air water space and you get air deep down. And then the, because of the fractures, you get, you get the water moving in there and you start getting freeze thaw and you start getting microbes getting back down in there. And when we did the, that infiltration pond, 
UD went out and checked it. We went to six feet. They could only check to three feet, but we increased KSAT from nine to 50 fold just at three feet. And that's why the thing the next year looked like a, a beach. So Interesting. Uh, so on a somewhat related question here, someone was asking if there are any examples of using subsoiling with biochar directly fed into the hole behind the subsoiler blade. Would that be as effective as mixing it into the top few inches? Um, if you're doing agriculture and you're using it to plant through, I would say from a cost standpoint, that's probably a good way to go. If you're trying to create a, a um, a BMP or stormwater type facility, I would say fracturing or subsoiling and then amending the top with, with the biochar. Because that whole thing's gonna act as a filter. Mm -hmm. And when you start getting runoff from pavement, you can get a good volume of water coming off of a pavement. And you wanna be able to be sure um, that you can get all the water in there. If you're starting to work on any slope, so you're you know more of a slope, then you could basically subsoil um, every few feet apart and and not be concerned about rotational failure or something like that. Switching gears a little bit here, uh, there's a question whether this kind of setup or system for filtration can be used on farms to filter silage and other farm water <laughs> farm runoff. Um, if so, how much land do you think would be required per farm size? Well, and how I mean, much it's, it's going to be cost. Yeah, so like you saw that the little one I did of the bio or bio swale uh, on the farm that was a horse farm, and that was a that was a tiny little thing, and it's capturing the barn water runoff and stuff. Actually, Tom Miles and I did a presentation uh, on using biochar in what I would call ag BMPs, best managed practices. Um, as part of the Center for Watershed Protection, I do have that presentation and it's like all these different farm BMPs that you could get biochar into. So your, your, your BMPs are, are sized based off the volume of water you're trying to treat. So I can't, I can't specify um, how big they would be. Mm -hmm. So a question on whether biochar can be used in an actual storm sewer system that is the supplement stormwater catch basin basins to clean up road runoff. I understand it's used in swales, rain gardens, greenways, et cetera. So are they, I'm trying to understand the question a little better. Um, storm sewer, so they, are they, depending on where they are in the world, is it a combined storm, storm sewer system, which we're disconnecting in the US? Yeah. But as it relates to, again, water quality, yeah, I mean, I, I, anywhere that you're needing to treat water, as long as the velocities are not so high that you, you could do it. Now, even in areas where water, and I, I had slides on this, but we don't have the time. When you talk about, say, stream restoration and stream bank restoration and floodplain restoration, there are many ways to utilize biochar in that to increase your hyperreic zones. Um, the great thing about biochar is an underground irrigation system. So if you have a ditch and you got biochar and you put it out on the, on the floodplain area of the ditch, you literally are going to move the water up into that riparian zone because of capillary action, the porosity of the water. You can move water uphill using biochar. So you can create your, your treatment area is going to be much greater with the use of biochar in the soil. <clears throat> so there's, there's ways of doing it. Interesting. Uh, so there was a question um, in your biochar specifications you used for the HC ratio 0.5, but they're saying the IBI spec is 0.7. Uh, why the difference? I'm sure Where it's a temperature we, thing. I, I would think 0.7 is the minimum it can be used, but that's a fairly low temperature biochar. And if you were saying you preferred high porosity, um, then that's probably what you're going to get with a higher temperature. Yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> the material that uh, we're getting is around 900, I believe it's 900 C, 950 C. <clears throat> so it's way up there, um, very high surface area uh, on it. So and it would probably have a pretty low HC ratio, I'm guessing. 
I, if I recall, it's a, I thought it was 0. 0.3. Yeah. Point, somewhere around 0. 0.3, 0. 0.27, something like that. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, there's a lot more questions we're not going to get to, and they keep coming in. I'm trying to stick to the ones that are most related to this. There's, there's a lot of off-topic things, <laughs> such as, is anyone producing biochar at larger scale, greater than 100,000 tons? Uh, to which my answer is, I don't think so. Well, maybe one or two, but they're selling it for charcoal <laughs> right. and not biochar. Um, yeah, the largest I'm hearing is, and they're not even there yet, is 40,000 tons, but. But having said that, there is a lot in, uh, in production that, you know, in the next couple of years with um, permitting and all that, there's, there's going to be a lot more coming online, even just this year. I would say if I had to guess, there's probably going to be an increased capacity of 30 to 40 percent year on year for the next several years, at least. Um, yeah, so generic questions on what sort of biomass is best material for biochar production. Um, the answer is it depends on what you're trying to do with the biochar. Um, the most important thing is to have this as a building code for green space with pervious pavers concrete. The water runoff is very bad due to flooding. I would agree. I think you addressed that to some extent. Um, yeah, do you want to just mention how, I, I know this was in the, the older UDEL um, report, how cost effective the use of biochar is compared to some, some other stormwater management techniques? Yeah. Um... In the urban areas now, the average across the U.S. is about $250,000 per impervious acre to treat, whatever type of BMPs that you're using. In our, my region, it could get as high as three to 400000 just because of land prices and things like that. What we found was that because of the ability of the biochar and at least in the amended greenways, um, we, could, we could reduce the amount of land we need to treat the same amount of water, which when you're land constrained, utilities and, and overall costs, it's significantly lower. Um, it, it is in the UD, I don't have a dollar figure in mind at this point, it's been a while, but we had like, the top, we have a table in there that shows like the top 25 BMPs used. And the cheapest is erosion and sediment control, right? I mean, it's just, that's pretty straightforward. The other one I think might've been street sweeping. Um, and then below that was, was the actual use of biochar in buffers. So it's, it's in that, it's in that uh, Science Foundation study. Uh, but so it people is- people should be using it. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's a very, I, I'm guessing when it was 250 and again, this was 2014, whatever, if I recall, it was about 32,000 to $35,000 per impervious acre to use biochar. And was that before the, uh, uh, carbon markets started rewarding yes. biochar producers? So with yeah. that, it's going to be even lower. Well, yeah, because, well, that's if bio, they sell their biochar cheaper, but the, the um, no, I mean, when, you, when you're looking at it from a, from a stormwater water quality aspect, the governments aren't looking at the carbon sequestration. They weren't. They are now looking at carbon sequestration activities, but they're, they're, they were more what is the actual cost to treat a pound of nitrogen, a pound of phosphorus, or an impervious acre is their metric. So yes, biochar is a very inexpensive approach. Mm -hmm. A number of reasons. One, you already own the land. And number two, if you're using private land and those spaces like the green, green greenways, the landowners are cutting the grass and maintaining it. So you don't have maintenance costs. And that's that's a huge, huge aspect. Yeah. I'm Harry going to take one more question and then maybe you want to wrap things up. And this comes from uh, my friend Shannon at Cornell. Um, she said they have uh, done a lot of work on structured soils. It's made with a lot of rocks um, to enable urban tree growth. Uh, how do you imagine biochar can be involved in this process? Someone at Cornell was thinking about trying to incorporate biochar into their structured soils to help with nutrient and water retention. And I think this is the Stockholm biochar. It is. Stuff. 
Yeah. Replace the peat. <laughs> oh. Which everybody should be and, doing anyway. And, and, and I believe that the structural soil also has like a polymer in it, if I recall. So it's a polymer and I believe peat. Now you could go to courier peat, which is coconut, but either way, there is no reason to have those materials based on what I've seen and all for the Stockholm approach. So that would be that would be the biggest thing that I that I would say. Great. Well, Harry, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, thanks, everybody for hanging on and uh, special thanks to Kathleen, who's been on all three of our our webinars and done a superb job helping me out of my bandwidth issues. And then uh, special thanks to Chuck too. Uh, excellent presentation as usual, Chuck. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time. And we will um, pull together the, the questions and, and get them answered and posted in a, a document to the, uh, um, the website where the, uh, every, well, all the resources will be housed at the same website. And we'll send that address out to everybody who, who registered for the webinar. So thank you all much and have a good day. Thanks, Harry. Thank you.